I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're safe, sound, and very healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of, at least for now, virtual conversations on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Robert Malley, uh, the Biden administration's special envoy for Iran, and in the interest of full disclosure, a close friend for, uh, for many years. Rob's had a distinguished career uh, at president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, has served under the Obama administration in several different roles at the National Security Council, and we work together very closely in the Clinton administration on efforts to broker uh, an Arab, Arab Israeli and Israeli Palestinian peace. Perhaps more on that uh, later. Rob, first of all, let me welcome you to Carnegie Next and thank you, uh, a thousand thank yous for, um, for doing this. I'm reminded of the old expression, no good deed goes unpunished, but that certainly won't be the case, uh, won't be the case here. Uh, but again, welcome. Um, we don't have a lot of time uh, and we have a lot to explore. I wanted to divide the conversation into three simple parts, the past, the present, and the future. That's hard with Iran because the past is often prologue and there's so many uncertainties associated now with our uh, negotiations and our, <clears throat> our efforts to broker um, some sort of, uh, of, of arrangement out of the JCPOA or something else. But let me start with the past. Looking back now, uh, you were appointed in January of this year, 2021. Looking back now, was there a moment or an alternative approach that might have created a different situation to where we are now, or is where we are now more or less where we had to uh, end up, in your view, now looking backwards? First, Aaron, thanks. It's really a pleasure to, to be talking to you and to everyone through you. Um, you know, it's a good question, but let me start. Of course, we didn't need to be here if uh, the prior administration had not unilaterally withdrawn from the deal. Everything that people who are worried about what we're seeing from Iran's nuclear program, and rightfully worried, the runaway nuclear program, higher levels of enrichment, more advanced centrifuges, work on uranium metal, uh, uh, obstacles to the access by the, by the IEA, all of that is in violation of the deal, which Iran had been respecting until uh, the U.S. withdrew. So I think there certainly was an alternative path in which we would be in a very different situation if we had not withdrawn from the deal. But that's what's done is done. And then you ask the question, was there, I assume your question is, was there an alternative path starting in January? Um, you know, some of our, some of the commentators, some of our, our former common friends have said, well, why didn't the U.S. act sooner and take some kind of step to, to, to uh, create trust with Iranians? You know, I'll let historians debate what could have been, but what is clear, and it's been clear since April, is that the U.S., the Biden administration, put on the table ideas which meant if Iran had negotiated and reached, had they reached this understanding, all of the sanctions that were inconsistent with the JCPOA, with the nuclear deal, would have been lifted and would have been lifted very quickly. So in terms of a confidence-building step, in terms of the Biden administration establishing its bona fides vis-a-vis -vis Iran, that was the most important step that the administration could have taken. So, you know, as I said, people could say, why didn't you take a confidence building measure earlier on? The fact is the major confidence building measure was to tell the Iranians, we are prepared to remove all of the sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration that were inconsistent with the deal. And therefore we could get back to the business that we should have been on. And that's where we are today. And I think that's the choice that Iran faces. Are they prepared to go back to that, or do they want to choose a different? I mean, there are those who argue that you know the, the administration, the president, simply should have put uh, checked the box on should have well, he's re up Paris climate, rejoin WHO, reverse the Muslim ban. Why not just check the box with respect to Iran? On the other hand, there are many who argue, perhaps more realistically, that. That, that his predecessor's withdrawal from the agreement created a new set of reality, more sanctions, 
Iran's regional behavior and Biden's own priorities in the region. We'll come back to this question later because it cuts to the core of what represents, I think, a key to, to any successful negotiation, which is the degree to which each party attaches urgency to getting this, this done. Um, so you've had six rounds of, of talks uh, in Vienna. Take us through, if you can, I know you can't talk about the substance of the negotiations and where the sides differ in any detail, but in terms of the process, take us through a average day, if there is such a thing, in the life of, of Rob Malley in Vienna. How did this process actually work? Well, it didn't work the way it should have for a very simple reason that you and I'm sure everyone else on this uh, podcast is aware of, which is the Iranians have refused to have direct communication with us, direct contact with us. So everything has been done through intermediaries. You know, when we're in Vienna, the E3, France, Germany, the UK are there, the Russians are there, the Chinese are there, and the EU uh, coordinator is there. And uh, our work consists in talking to them before they meet with the Iranians and then messages are passed to the Iranians. The Iranians negotiate or talk to their interlocutors who then convey back to us. That by definition, and you've been a negotiator, you've been a negotiator in all kinds of different formats that you and I experienced with Israel and the Syrians and the Palestinians. It's not a particularly constructive one. It's one that lends itself to delays. It one that ones that dealt that lends itself to misunderstandings. And that all of that has happened in the space of those six rounds where at the end of the day, you weren't entirely clear what each side, what the Iranians were saying or what, and I'm sure the Iranians had questions about what we were saying. So the day is, is punctuated by these meetings with third parties who are dealing, I mean, members of the P5 plus one, uh, who are dealing with the, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany plus the EU, who are dealing with Iran and who are trying to do their best to negotiate and to convey our positions. So that's the day. And, and it, it, you could imagine what it's like. It could be quite frustrating because you would, you know, the essence of a negotiation is to try to get a sense from your vis-a-vis uh, what really matters to them and what, what their priorities are and how you can work through those priorities and overcome obstacles. You can't do that or you can't do that that easily if there's no direct communication. Everything you're doing is through indirection and that's what that's what's happened. And so we're hoping still that the Iranians would be prepared to sit down with us. That's not a concession to the United States. It's a favor to diplomacy and therefore it's a favor to what should be the joint effort to get back into compliance with the JCPOA. Again, if that's Iran's intent, there's a shortcut, there's an easier way to do it than the way it's been done through six rounds in Vienna so far. Right, so if you were running the railroad, the the preferred modality would be a direct negotiation. W would a direct negotiation in many respects though have, have made a difference or would, have, would it have accentuated the differences? At one point you and I talked and I think you said that given where the parties were, you could have ended up with some pretty volatile direct negotiations between the parties. So, so on balance, that would be your preference if in fact you could create such a circumstance? I mean, that's be clear. This is not just a negotiation between the US and Iran. It has to be one between the P5 plus one and Iran. But I have no doubt, of course, you know, we were spared some of the, the diatribes and the accusations against the US and some of the volatility that you mentioned. But on balance, I think there's no doubt that the negotiation would have been more effective, would have lent itself, as I said, to fewer misunderstandings. We may still not have reached a deal, but I think we would have had a clearer sense of where we were had we been able to talk to the Iranians directly. You know, we're not going to we're not going to beg the Iranians. We just think that would be better for both of us. But if Iran insists on indirect talks, then whenever they resume, that's what we'll do. But I think it's clear, and I think it was clear to the Iranian negotiators themselves this was not the, the ideal way to do business. Before we move to the president, I want to ask a couple of, of other questions. One on um, the uh, the tragic situation of the uh, dual nationals that are have been imprisoned by the Iranians. I mean, Iran is a serial human rights abuser. I think with the exception of China, it executes more people uh, on, on an average uh, per, per year. And these negotiations aren't just about nuclear issues there's a human dimension to them. And you are in touch with the families, I know. Um, what is the administration's view, position, and thinking on trying to secure the release of, of, of these Americans? 
So I, and thanks for raising that, Aaron. So separate and apart from the talks on the, on, on the nuclear deal, we've been engaged, again, indirectly with Iran from day one on talks about securing the release of the four Americans who've been unjustly, cruelly, and outrageously detained as, as, as pawns uh, by the Iranian government, and also to get clarity on, on the fate of some uh, missing persons, in, in particular Bob Levinson. So we've had those talks through uh, third parties, but with ups and downs, we, we, we made real progress and then, and, but haven't concluded. And as you said, I'm in touch very regularly with, uh, with the families of the detainees. Today is the sixth anniversary of the detention of Siamak Namazi. Uh, we're gonna, the Secretary of State will be meeting with, uh, with his brother Babak in just a few hours. Uh, and it is really one of the most painful aspects of, 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 of this experience. But we will do everything. It's a priority for the president, for the Secretary of State, for my entire team to make sure that they get home and they get home safely as soon as possible. And we'll continue to work on it again, regardless of what happens on the nuclear deal, whether those succeed or collapse, which we have this separate track, which we are insistent on, on pursuing uh, to get everyone home. Yeah, I mean, you, the, your formal position, of course, is that uh, there, there is no linkage, and I think obviously that's the right position. But as a practical matter, these individuals are being used, as they've been used in the past, as as pawns, as instruments uh, in a negotiation on any number of issues. Um, so, as a practical matter, the reality would dr will drive this train. No, I mean an improvement in U.S.-Iranian relations, a deal. Um, that is even transactional could possibly set the stage for their release. Um, it's hard to imagine the Iranians giving up these cards. Uh, and I, I'm sure you, you, we've called them out we've repeatedly publicly. Uh, no private conversation separately on the issue of the hostages. So Aaron, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if you could hear me now. I couldn't hear your question. There was, I, I, no, so I, I apologize. You know, there are all sorts of third party efforts, I know, in train to secure the release of hostages, but the administration's position is no linkage, correct? I mean, there's no linkage with the JCPOA talks and the Iranians take the same position. And frankly, I think, you know, obviously this is a difficult negotiation to get our detainees out, but I do think that it is in. Rob, I think I lost you here. I think I lost you there for a minute. Are you there? I'm sorry. This seems yeah. to be a, a, I don't know. Tell me if you could hear me now. This seems to be I hear you. I hear you now. Okay. I'm saying we, we have separated them. They, the Iranians say that they want to separate them. And so there's no reason they need to be linked. We should re be able to reach an understanding on the, on the early, immediate release of, of, of detainees who've done nothing wrong other than been American citizens who, who were in Iran and that, and they shouldn't be punished for that. All right. Uh, before we move on to the president, one final question. You've had 10 months uh, and a lot of time at ICG and in other roles to digest and to analyze Iran's behavior. After 10 months in your formal role, can you, are you any closer to determining or having any sense of what Iran really wants out of this process? It's a good question. I was thinking particularly because I knew that you and I would be talking when we go back, uh, you know, there've been all these debates, how close Israelis and Palestinians were to reaching a deal at Camp David in the year 2000. And it, with the benefit of hindsight, hindsight, we have a slightly different appreciation of how close or how close we were not. <laughs> I think we'll have to wait to see whether what we were hearing from the Iranians throughout those six rounds. And I want to make clear, this, our assessment at the time was that we were making real progress. It wasn't just our assessment. It was the assessment of the Europeans. It was the assessment of the Russians. It was the assessment of the Chinese. In fact, it was the assessment of the Iranian negotiators themselves who were saying publicly that we were close to an understanding. So if you take that at face value, we had a pretty good sense of what the Iranians were looking for. Now, two big caveats. One, were we really reading the Iranians correctly even then? And two, we now have a different team, uh, uh, different leadership, a different president that is clearly stating that it wants to do things differently. And so we're going to have to see whether what we were negotiating, what we were negotiating and thinking that we we're making real progress towards a resumption of mutual compliance with the deal, whether that is still the case. And I have to say, I know we're coming to the present and to the future, but every day that goes by, we're getting a piece of Iran's answer. Every day where they are not coming back to the table, every day where they're making statements about how little was achieved in Vienna, 
which is what the current team is saying, is telling us that this is a team that may not, in fact, be prepared to come back into what we would consider and what the rest of the P5 plus one would consider full mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. And so, of course, we have to prepare for a world, which we're doing now in consultation with our partners from the region. Again, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, about a world where Iran doesn't have constraints on a super program and we have to consider options to deal with that, which is what we're doing, even as we hope that we can get back to the deal. That is by far our preference. But as I said, Iran is giving us its answer by what it's doing and not doing every day. And we need to we need to take that into account. Right. It, it does raise the question, we'll get back to it, I hope, of, of urgency, which is critically important in any negotiation. The, the balance between how much pain there is and how much prospects there is for gain. Because if there's insufficient pain and insufficient gain, well, from our common experience in the Arab-Israeli-Israeli-Palestinian issue, we end up with something that kind of remotely resembles the status quo. Now, the present. Uh, you may get your answer if, if and when you return to Vienna. Some would argue that the geopolitical environment for the success of these negotiations really has deteriorated. You've got a new Iranian government that is acting more aggressively on, with respect to nuclear activities. You have harder line uh, foreign ministers, perhaps a, a new negotiator. You have the image that the U.S. has been weakened by the Afghan withdrawal. The president is entering perhaps the most intense period of his presidency, where in effect his presidency in the next several months may actually hang in the balance as a consequence of several domestic issues that are in play. And you've got tensions with China, which is somehow re might reduce leverage at the negotiating table. As you look at a return to Vienna, does any of this ring true? Listen, obviously the, the, the context we're facing today is different from the context that, that uh, the Obama administration was facing in 2015 for some of the reasons you mentioned. I may not agree with all of them, but certainly it's a different context. And let's not forget one major change is that since then Iran has experienced a unilateral U.S. withdrawal, which is a trust deficit that, that needs to be overcome. Uh, relations between uh, the U.S. And, and China in particular, not what, what, what they were. But the fundamental equation, the fundamental equation that was at the heart of the deal in 2015-16 and which, and which remains pertinent today, which is Iran want, uh, being able to get sanctions relief and the U.S. and its partners, international partners, being able to put constraints on Iran's nuclear program to give us confidence that Iran is not trying to break out to reach, uh, to, 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 to develop a nuclear bomb. That equation remains, it's the same one. And so, you know, we could try to reinvent the wheel a thousand ways, the geopolitical circumstances could change. But at, at bottom, if Iran wants sanctions relief, and we know that we want to see Iran's nuclear program with the constraints that were imposed by the nuclear deal, then that, I mean, as I said, that core hasn't changed. A lot of things in the environment have, and therefore we've had to, we have to adjust to the new environment as, as others do. But at bottom, that remains the, the, the equation that we, and the equilibrium that we think is still on the table. And Iran has to decide again, whether it is, whether they have that feeling that you just mentioned, the feeling of urgency that they want to get to that. And, and if not, again, we will be prepared to adjust to a different reality in which we have to deal with all options to address Iran's uh, uh, nuclear program if it's not prepared to come back into the, the constraints of, uh, of 2016. So it's, it's a more complicated environment, that's true. In some ways, you know, we could, I'm sure we'll get into it. In some ways, it's a more, it's a more hostile environment. And sometimes, in some ways, it's a less hostile environment. I mean, one big change from 2016 to today, if I may, is that uh, Iran's regional, uh, it, its neighbors, are now engaging with Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab uh, uh, Emirates, all of the other countries of the, of the Gulf Cooperation Council are now having interactions with Iran, which they were not having. Uh, many of them were not having back in 2016. That's a different environment. You have the, 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 the normalization accord between Israel and, and, its, and uh, a number of Arab countries. That's also a new element. And, and those can, in fact, lead to greater de-escalation uh, if, if we use them uh, in, in, in a proper way and create more incentives to address the nuclear crisis with Iran. But as I say, there are pluses and minuses. At bottom, the, what was struck in 2016 should remain relevant today, again, if, if, if Iran is prepared to do so. 
Yeah, and we're going to get back to both the issue of um, of Iran's relations with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the Israeli piece of this, which um, uh, which I think is quite intriguing. I want to ask you about China. Our mutual friend Karim Sajipur, my current colleague at Carnegie, um, has argued that um, U.S.-China tensions plus Iran's growing capacity to export oil to China and China's willingness to buy has somehow created a measure of resilience. I think in the last year or two, the Iranian economy has even grown by 2%, um, although the long-term prognosis is, is pretty severe without, without removal of sanctions and some integration into, into, um, into our normal economic reality. Have you, uh, have you noticed any uh, impact of U.S.-China tensions or Iran's relationship with China in this regard? I mean, there's no doubt that relations between the U.S. and China are not, are, you know, are, are not where they were, and 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 are facing uh, real tensions. At the same time, and, and and I think you know, so one can't underestimate that, and that's clearly a factor. At the same time, uh, all of the P5 plus one, and I think this is important to to to, to remind people, all of them have said that they think the negotiations should resume immediately. They think that they should they should start from where they were left off. And they also have expressed concern about uh, some of the the, the, the the nuclear steps that that uh, Iran has taken, whether it's uh, you know, expansion of its nuclear program or lack of cooperation with the IEA. So there is still that sense, and I think whether it's China or others, none of them have an interest in a crisis in, in the Gulf, particularly given uh, China's reliance on, on on imported oil. So we've had discussions with our Chinese colleagues. We're continuing to have them about. Uh, S sanctions and telling the, the the Chinese very very clearly, our preference is a return to the JCPOA in which the sanctions would be lifted and and China could import uh, Iran oil uh, uh, freely. Um, but if if Iran is not prepared to come back into the deal, then of course our sanctions remain and our sanctions will have to be enforced. I think the Chinese understand that. We, as I said, we are talking to them about it, as we're talking to all our partners about what to do to try to get Iran back into compliance and mutual compliance, us and Iran back into compliance, and what kind of world, what we will have to do if if that's not the case. And as you know, we have a number of you know visitors, including today, uh, <laughs> regional visitors, to talk just about that. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. In fact, let's turn to the Israeli factor element in all of this. Not only has there been a change in government in Iran, there's been a change of government in Israel, which is in many respects been much more meaningful. It's resulted, it seems to me, in a shift uh, of certainly in tactics. Prime Minister Bennett, arguably the weakest prime, is prime minister in the history of the state, um, has essentially taken the Iran issue, given the policies of his predecessor, out of American politics. He's no longer playing the republic Republican Democratic divide. And he's also taken the issue, it seems to me, largely out of the media. Every time I turn around today, there's another Israeli visiting Washington, coordinating or discussing Iran. So I guess my, my question to you is, what's your take on the Israeli factor? Has, has Bennett's emergence, and we should remind ourselves that Lapid, foreign minister of the state of Israel, though he may be, if this government survives, you're looking today at a trilateral meeting between the foreign minister of the of, of the Emirates, uh, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, and the putative prime minister of the state of Israel. What is your sense of coordination, cooperation uh, with the Israelis? And has the emergence of the Bennett government made your job, the administration's challenge any easier? So first I want to say, I mean, I was here obviously from January on and we were consulting quite closely with the former uh, uh, Israeli government, the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu. So I don't want to make it sound like there was, you know, it was night and day. We, we were cooperating, we were coordinating. We had a fundamental difference, it's true, uh, that dates back quite some time. Uh, the Now the government of, of, of Prime Minister Bennett the, the difference, as you said, is that they want to keep those differences behind closed doors as much as possible, but with, while, while making clear that they have genuine problems, real problems with the JCPOA, they want to work with us to see how we manage those differences in a scenario where we come back into the JCPOA or in a scenario where we do not. And 
we met with them, uh, our national, respective national security advisors had meetings last week. As you say, Foreign Minister Lapid is in town uh, uh, as we speak, meeting with, with Secretary Blinken and uh, the uh, Emirati Foreign Minister. Um, so we, are, we will be talking to them. We, will, we know we have some differences, but we also know that uh, we have a common purpose, which is to, to make sure that Iran cannot acquire a nuclear weapon. And in that, we are fully aligned and working, working together. And I'm, I'm confident that despite the differences we have, and to be very you know, plain, our differences have to do with the merits of coming back into the deal. Our position being that everything we hear from our Israeli uh, partners and from others about the concerns they have about Iran's nuclear program, all of those have been not only exacerbated, they've been created by the, the, the withdrawal from the JCPOA. And so we feel that coming back in would still be the best outcome, but we're realistic. We know that uh, there's a very, you know, there's, there's at least a good possibility that Iran has uh, is going to choose a different path, and and we need to we need to coordinate with with Israel and with our uh, other partners in the region. Uh, I'll be traveling to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar in just a matter of, of of days to talk about that, to talk about our efforts to come back into the JCPOA, and to talk about uh, what what options we have to control Iran's nuclear program if if, if we can't achieve that goal. And that's exactly what uh, Secretary Blinken will be talking to uh, Foreign Minister Lapid uh, throughout today. I want to ask you about the Saudis, the Emiratis, and Iran, but I want one more question on the Israelis. Do you sense, and the Israeli press is full of this, both in chatter and serious analysis, that there has been a change in Israel's position with respect to a negotiation over the JCPOA? Maybe it's a resignation. To, to reality, assuming the Iranians want to want to play ball and and y you and they can meet one another's needs, including the, the rest of the P5. But do you sense any uh, change, however slight, in their openness to consider uh, a situation which the previous government seemed to be un, uh, unalterably opposed? That is to say, a negotiated return to something that looks like the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action? So I, I really don't, don't want to speak for the Israeli government. I think they've made clear still that they have real, uh, to put it mildly, reservations about the, the nuclear deal, but they've also said that's a decision the U.S. will have to make if Iran is prepared to come back in. They, they, they understand and respect that decision, even if they disagree. I think at the same time, there's a lively debate in Israel among uh, former officials, security officials, about whether in hindsight, the withdrawal from the deal was a good decision and whether it in fact uh, improved or uh, weakened uh, uh, Israel's security. And I, I will leave it to Israelis to debate that, but I think in the pages of Israeli newspapers, you're seeing a much more lively debate than occurred uh, back in uh, at the time when, when President Trump uh, decided to withdraw from the deal, which I think was celebrated quite uh, um, strongly in Israel. I think today people realize that that was a decision that left uh, Iran unconstrained in its nuclear program, closer to uh, uh, to break out than it's been perhaps ever, and with a more aggressive regional posture. And so I think there is some rethinking, at least on the part of the, I'd say the the, the, the uh, security establishment in Israel. Uh, and that's you know that's obviously a position that 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 we've taken now for some time. Yeah, I also think, Rob, you've got an Israeli government that is is really very worried about the prospects of an open confrontation with the United States, frankly, and can't, cannot afford one. Let, let's go on now to the Gulf Saudis. There have been at least three rounds, I think, of, of meetings, negotiations that we know about between the Saudis and, and Iran since April. There's, there's reports this morning about the prospects of reestablishing consulates, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Iran, and even talk of restoration uh, of embassies. What's the upside and or the downside for these negotiations um, to see that sort of, um, those sorts of talks take place with a view, even if it's tactical, to uh, a better, more functional relationship between those two countries? So uh, let's put the, the nuclear negotiations to the side just for a second. I think this is, and I don't want to overstate what's been achieved between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I think it's been four rounds. I think if you speak to, 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 to Saudi officials, they will say, you know, so far progress has been quite minimal. But the fact that they're talking, as I say, the fact that the Emirates and uh, Iran have not just been talking, but dealing with one another, those are things 
that uh, we not only you know, that we welcome. We think that's a good thing if it could be accompanied by de-escalation. Of course, we still need to see how Iran will, uh, what its policies will be in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, in terms of of of, of not uh, continuing on the path of encouraging their proxies and their allies to engage in in in, in acts of violence. But the but so of course the proof will be in in what happens. But uh, engagement among countries in the region, engagement with Iran, uh, de-escalation, that's all things that we, we would encourage and we think that it's good for stability in the region. Keeping our eyes wide open, as you, as you mentioned at the beginning, in terms of what we should expect and how quickly things could change. How that affects the negotiations, frankly, I think it, you know, what it means is that we are very much uh, in tune with our Gulf partners in terms of, of, of looking and assessing uh, uh, our policy towards Iran. I just mentioned uh, I mean, the the, the uh, both the Saudi foreign minister and the Emirati foreign minister happen to be in town this week. Next week, I'll be in, in the Gulf. I think that we're finding that those conversations are extremely productive because some of the tensions that existed in 2015-16, and, and we can't, uh, don't want to hide them, there were some tensions over our negotiations uh, for the J, uh, to, to get uh, into the JCPOA and our policies of the region. I think at this point, we're finding a greater commonality of view. I'm not saying that it's it, it's perfect uh, convergence, but a greater commonality of view, both in terms of how to deal with Iran's nuclear program, how to deal with Iran's regional activities, and what's the best uh, way forward in terms of, of, of de-escalation of tensions in the region. So that's it. As I said, the more we are in sync with our partners, whether it's Israel, whether it's the uh, countries of the GCC, the better off we are because we could work as one in trying to address what is a, what is a common problem. Let me ask you one question about uh, today's trilateral. You know, Iran was a clear motivating force beginning a decade or so ago in stimulating quiet, discreet contacts between the Israelis and the Saudis and the Israelis and the Emiratis. But it seems to me, and like your view here, that neither Saudi Arabia, given its weakness and vulnerabilities, nor the Emirates, want to be the tip of the U.S. or Israeli spear when it comes to confronting Iran. I've often wondered, and maybe you could put on your ICG hat here for a minute. What is, the, what, is the, <laughs> what is the practical value with uh, of the Abraham Accords, these two relationships, well, Bahrain and the, and the Emirates with Israel, in relationship to Iran? Is, there a pra is it symbolic? Is it a political gain? Is there any strategic implication uh, with respect to Israeli uh, policies and views toward Iran of these relationships? So I, mean, I don't want to speak either for the Saudis or for the, for the Emiratis. I think they will, they're will they far better placed as commenting of, about how they view uh, the normalization, or in the case of the Emirates, the normalization, in the case of Saudi Arabia, who knows where, 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 they, will, uh, where they will end up in vis-a-vis in, in -vis Israel. But I think when you talk about the other countries, it's certainly a trend that is, as I said, you know, from the U.S. perspective, that's very welcome uh, to see to see uh, improved relations between some Arab countries and Israel. Anything that contributes to greater engagement, to greater uh, understanding on that front, is is something that we would that we would welcome. And again, in terms of how it affects policy towards Iran, the only thing I would say to that, again, without speaking for our partners, is de-escalation of tensions in the region, greater communication, greater understanding, that can only help. And, and to the extent that the U.S. has good relations with all of the, the with Israel and with the Gulf countries, um, it puts us in a better position to coordinate our policies, whatever, whatever, the, issue, uh, uh, whatever the issue may be. But the broader, the broader point I make is right now there is an opportunity in the region. You do have these discussions. You mentioned you have the discussions that I mentioned earlier between uh, Iran and some of its neighbors. One thing that could really put this in a very, in a very different, on a different path, a negative path, is if we see Iran's nuclear program crossing thresholds that would put us in a very different position, or Iran's regional activities leading us to uh, to the brink of, of of another escalatory dynamic. That's what could sort of uh, cut against the the positive trends. With some of the positive trends, I don't want to overstate it by any means, but some of these glimmers of positive trends in the region, and that's why we are determined through diplomacy, if at all possible, to address these issues, and otherwise looking, at, as, as the President made clear, uh, at, uh, at, at other options. But I want to, we didn't mention one point, uh, maybe you want to come to it, which is, because I just said dealing with these, the, the, the cohort of, of issues, it's not just nuclear, 
it's also regional. And this brings me to a question about how the U.S. views these follow-on talks or the, the, the follow-on agreements, which I, I, I assume you were. <laughs> I was getting I was getting ready to ask you that. You're going to ask a question or I could answer uh, <laughs> proactively. Um, listen, our view on that, and we've said this from the beginning, the JCPOA we think is an important under, uh, important deal. It's one that we think achieved uh, the objective that was assigned to it, but it's also a limited deal. And we obviously, and I'm, 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 you know, there are many in this country who believe that it needed to be expanded or complemented by other issues that it had not dealt with. And there are many in Iran, and this is something that we have found now through six rounds of talks and through everything we hear from the new Iranian government. They would like to get something more than the JCPOA in terms of the kind of sanctions relief that they're looking for. So our position is clear. We think the best way forward, and we also thought that that's what Iran believed, is to get back to the JCPOA and then discuss ways of bolstering, of strengthening it, of dealing with issues that remain very divisive between Iran and the United States. And we think this would be to our mutual benefit. There are things that Iran still wants in terms of sanctions. There are things that we still want in terms of, of, of Iran's uh, posture. And so we think that's the best way. Let's get back to the JCPOA to calm things down, to get some benefit for both sides, and then let's let's build on it. If Iran comes back to the table whenever they come back for the seventh round and put on the table issues that clearly go beyond the confines of the JCPOA, and that's sort of what we're hearing. May, we may be wrong, but that's what we're, we're hearing. Then we're prepared to have a negotiation about a different kind of deal, a deal that would address more issues in the JCPOA. But Iran is going to have to make a choice, and it can't have it both ways. It can't say that the U.S. has to give more than the JCPOA, and Iran is going to give only what the JCPOA requires, or perhaps even less than the JCPOA requires. Either we're both going to have a deal that is strictly in conformity with the JCPOA, or we're going to have to have a deal that's different, where we could bring different issues to the table, and they do. But again, it, it has to be one or the other. It can't be better for Iran and not better for the U.S. Right. Well, any negotiation that succeeds and endures has got to be based on a balance of interests. Um, whether that can be achieved or not is obviously w what you're trying to test. So just to be clear, so the longer the notion of a longer and stronger agreement is not a artfully contrived talking point designed to manage opposition to the agreement, particularly from the Israelis. It is actually a an objective that you would like to see if the Iranians are interested in cooperating, uh, whether it can be achieved or not. I neither of us know that, but it's not just a talking point. So I, you know, sometimes by simplifying it, we we make it more more difficult to understand. There's a whole host of issues, whether it's regional issues, whether it's uh, nuclear issues, that we still believe, or whether it's sanctions issues. Because as 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 we've said, we understand, and you just said it. It has to be based on a balance of interest. There are things that we feel the JCPOA doesn't cover that we wish we could have understandings with Iran about. And there are things that Iran clearly is not satisfied with about the JCPOA. In fact, they've said publicly that even back in 2016 and 17, when the JCPOA was uh, being implemented, that they felt it didn't go far enough. So we think that there should be a new, a, 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 a possibility to negotiate with Iran something that is stronger, that is broader than what was negotiated the JCPOA, not instead of the JCPOA. Again, our view is let's get back to the JCPOA, but it's not a talking point. And again, when I hear our critics saying you'll have no leverage, there's nothing that once you're back in the JCPOA, what will the incentive be? Well, the proof is that Iran is not right now, uh, is saying as we speak and throughout six rounds of, of, of talks has put, brought to the table, has raised issues, that go beyond the four corners of the JCPOA. So there clearly are things that they are looking for that go beyond what was negotiated in 2016. And there are things that we're looking for that go beyond that. And so what we're telling the Iranians is, let's not look at the JCPOA as the end of the policy. Let's hopefully look at it as the beginning of more negotiations, difficult ones, as you said, we'll have to see how far we go, but ones where we know that there are things that Iran wants and we know there are things uh, that, that, that we want. And I would just say, you know, if we had remained within the JCPOA, then we would have had all these years of implementing it. And at this point, I believe we would have been in talks with Iran about these other issues. And so, again, it just goes to how catastrophic a decision it was to um, unilaterally withdraw. We're now talking to Iran about the issues of the JCPOA 
rather than talking to Ron about issues that go beyond it. And that's one of the legacies that we're, we're dealing with now. Right. One question before we turn to the future. How do you respond to, to those who argue that on timelines alone, the JCPOA is fast approaching its sell-by date, that the Iranians won't, will not unlearn what they've learned over the course of the last four or five years with respect to their nuclear capacity, that even if you do return to the JCPOA, it really doesn't solve or answer the mail uh, with respect to the problem of Iran's putative nuclear weapons aspiration. The one screwdriver turn away from the capacity to produce enough fissile material and then miniaturize a warhead and, and do the physics package that's necessary to actually make a deliverable nuclear device. So very uh, briefly, because I, I know we don't have much time. But let me, there's, there's two, two, two questions in what you say. Number one, so many of our people who say that also are pointing with alarm to steps that Iran could reverse, levels of enrichment, the types of centrifuges that are enriching, the obstacles to IEA access and inspections, the work on uranium metal, all of that, which people are rightly, as I said, anxious and, and worried about. If we were back in the JCPOA, those would all be, uh, you could all reverse that. Now, you raise the second issue, which Secretary Blinken and others have been very clear about. The point will come. And it's not that far into the future where Iran's nuclear advances, the knowledge advances will be such and will be irreversible that we could not recapture the essence of the non-proliferation benefits that were negotiated in 2016. When we reach that point, of course, we're going to have to reassess what we're looking for at the table, uh, at the negotiating table, because if we can't achieve what we bargained for, then obviously we're, we're talking about a different kind of, 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 of deal. We're not there yet. And on that, I trust our experts. I'm not going to, you know, uh, I know that many people have different views, but our experts tell us that as of today, if we were back in the JCPOA, we could recapture the non-proliferation benefits that we bargained for. That's still our pursuit. We'll have to see again whether whether Iran is interested or not. All right, two two last questions, and you've been exceedingly generous with your time and your and your insights. Um, and I know you can't answer this one. I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> What is what is your best guess? The two questions are, are related. What is your best guess as to when, not not day certain, a seventh round will convene in Vienna? So for uh, mid October. Yeah, I and mean, this is not what I'm going to say. It's not really a cop out. I'm going to say I think there's too much focus on the date. Sure, we would have liked to resume the talks a month ago, two months ago. It's now been almost four months since we we we, we interrupted the talks. But the point for us is really, whenever those talks resume. Is Iran coming back with a realistic view about how to come back uh, into compliance with the deal, or are they coming back with a completely different notion? If they're coming back with a completely different notion, then with then these talks are going to go on for a long time. It's going to be very difficult. We have to consider all options to, to try to address uh, Iran's uh, uh, out of control or unconstrained nuclear program. So we're just as interested with the substance of what Iran comes back with as we are with the date. The date. You know, I, I could try to guess, uh, and it would just it wouldn't be worth uh, much. Right. Ultimately, you know, that's something that we decide. Right. Final question, and I will I will provoke here more than and annoy. Um, let's set aside the question whether Iran wants an agreement, any agreement, or a deal that strikes that balance of interests uh, price point, which is critically important to success of any negotiation. Here's my last question, Rob, and I ask it in, in good faith and in good conscience. Do, do we want a deal anytime soon? And I say this only because of my conviction that the champagne bottle corks will not be popping in Washington if, in fact, you succeed in renegotiating a return to the JCPOA. There's a lot of opposition to this agreement. Everything in this town is political. The president faces critical domestic issues, which will already require tremendous expenditure of political capital. So it's an it's a softball question in many respects, but what underlies it is a very serious point. Do so we? I'll be, be, I'll be very clear, uh, and I'm not. You know, I obviously don't deal with all the the, the political aspects of of, of of this administration. But what's been clear is that the, President Biden, his administration, want to address Iran's. The, the, the problems we face with Iran's uh, nuclear program. We, it, it would not be in our interest to see further advances of Iran's nuclear program, which brings them closer to breakout point and which forces us to take certain decisions to try to address it. So the answer is clear. 
from a national security point of view, we are prepared to come back in mutual compliance with the JCPOA as soon as Iran is. And that's that's been my mandate, that's been my charge, and it's, there's never been any, any, any question about it. Again, we're prepared to live, and we have to be prepared to live with a world in which Iran is not interested. But if Iran is interested, we're prepared to do it, we're prepared to do it in good faith. Seriously, all the P5 plus one have witnessed what we prepared to put on the table, and I think that they would vouch for the good faith efforts that we've made to come back into compliance with the deal. But it will take Iran's willingness to say yes. So we'll prepare to come back as soon as possible, and, and all those other issues will not affect the core national security interest we have. But that core national security interest also means that if Iran is not interested, we're prepared to deal with that eventuality as well. Rob Milley, I want to thank you. Nobody Thanks, forced, you to, forced you to do this. It was terrific. You're in, you're, you are inestimable. And um, uh, good luck with the challenges that, that you face ahead. And thanks again. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. And thanks for, for having me on your podcast. Thank you for listening to Carnegie Connects, a production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Views expressed are those of the host and guest panelists, and not necessarily those of the Carnegie Endowment, which takes no institutional positions on public policy issues. Subscribe to Carnegie Connects on popular platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. Like what you heard today? Learn more at carnegieendowment.org slash Carnegie Connects. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Catherine Buchanan and Cliff Jayapranata are our executive producers. I'm Aaron David Miller, and until next time, think positive and test negative.